It's the next level. Hey, my name is Ross Marquand and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. Okay. Forget the brick. New joke. Three heroes die and they all show up at the pearly gates. God's there to decide what their eternal fate shall be. Heaven or hell. Our first hero is dressed up like a big owl. And God says to him, I gifted you the ability to make fantastic inventions. What did you do with this amazing talent? And Owl Guy says, I made this really awesome flying ship and lots of cool outfits and weapons so that I could bring peace to the city. God asks, so how many people did you kill? Owl Guy seems offended. Zero. He says, "I I I didn't take a single life. God frowns. Sorry, Owl Guy. Your heart's in the right place, but you're just too soft. God snaps his fingers. And the hero goes to hell. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this week we are discussing Watchmen Season 1, Episode 3. She was killed by space junk. <laughs> And there's no Space Junk song by that one band that you ever heard of, but no. <laughs> yeah, well, she plays the Devo song there at the beginning, and apparently there's a line in it about about Space Junk or, or something like that. So, I don't know, yeah. maybe, maybe you can get the Peter Dinklage Space Pants song <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and, and play it from Saturday Night Live. But, no, I really, really, I continue to just love each and every episode, like each episode, I mean, I know it's only three episodes in, but each episode has been better than, better than the one before, in, right. in my opinion. And so I really, really love, I love, I absolutely love the fact that we have, they have brought Gene Smart into the cast and she's such a, a, a original, just, just adding that addition to the cast with that connection to the comic is so great and is so iconic that I can't wait to see what they do with her going forward and how she affects the story as a whole. Because th this is not just like, and I'm sure we'll get into it when we get to our top five, but it, this is not just like the the little vignettes we've got of the Lord of the Manor, and I'm sure we'll get to him later. But she's actually incorporated into our story, our active, a you know main plot line story. So yeah. I, I'm excited to see where they go with her. I, I absolutely love the actress and love what she's doing here with this character. Yeah, the, I'm like you. I'm every episode has been good. A lot of a few of my friends at work and on outside of work were saying to me, "I'm not really into it," but a few people actually said, "I'm really digging it. I'm hoping it gets better." I said, "It should get better with every episode as it's been so far since episode." Do you think the people that aren't really getting into it as much maybe they weren't as big a fans of the comic maybe they were more fans of the movie and it is so different in tone in direction i mean there is a lot of things as far as the the tv show goes that are very different from the Zack snyder movie you know and not just the the storyline not just the fact that the story follows the comic book not the movie but just other things about, in some ways, it's darker tonally, but it's not darker, like, scene-wise. Like, the color saturation in the movie is very dark. But the show, I haven't I haven't noticed that. Well, this got really dark in this episode. Right, but no, I, no, 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 I don't mean the subject matter. I mean, I mean the, the, the appearance, the brightness of the actual light in the episodes. That, oh, yes. that yeah. the, the, the movie itself is very dark depending on and i don't mean dark tonally i mean dark as a as a whole just the way it's it's uh filmed. presented yeah presented i don't know what the word the word that i'm searching for is it's dark that you know i there was a couple of scenes where i had to turn the brightness up myself that kind of thing is what i mean yeah. whereas the direction the way the show is being directed being the fact and i mentioned this in the last episode the fact that the first two episodes especially had very different direction by the director from the way the shots were made. And even in this episode, we have a few really cool shots 
But this one is even different. It's a different director in this third episode from the first two as well. Yes. It, it seems like they toned it down from a lot of the hate. And the it, the investigation is still there. Mm-hmm. And there's crime based upon it, but just based upon the uh, the gang itself. But they they don't show the hate as much as it was prevalent in the in the first two episodes with the uh, you know it being, yeah not it was more targeted more towards the police than it was being racially right well in this in this episode we're getting we're getting Agent Blake's perspective on things. Pretty yeah. much. Pretty much the entire episode is – I mean we don't see Louis Gossett Jr. We don't see – we we only see Angela Abar through the eyes uh, pretty much really. I'm trying to think because I watched it again for the third or fourth time here just a few minutes ago. And I'm trying to think if there was any scene that was not from the perspective of Agent Blake. And I don't think so. I think this entire episode – was her perspective on things. Now that I think about that, is that really we didn't get, I don't think we got anything. Yeah. Yeah. Does it occur to you? I'm trying to think of any scene that did not involve Agent Blake pretty much primarily. I mean, mm-hmm. besides the Adrian, besides the master of the manor uh, scenes. Now those yeah. obviously uh, were separate from her, but I mean, as Definitely. far as our main, our main storyline is it goes, I mean, yeah, it's her following her investigation, following her around. Yeah. Her talking to uh, Dr. Manhattan through a phone. Right, through the phone. And then it's her, you know, when she's going, to, when she goes to see the heroes, she sees the heroes at the back of the van when she yeah. meets Red Scare and her Pirate. Perspective Pirate her Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and she goes into the pod and she talks to Looking Glass. All of it, everything from this, of this episode was Agent Blake's perspective on things. And that's an interesting take. I don't think we're going to get that going forward. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm almost no. sure they're going to, they're going to switch perspectives around and gives us, give us other, uh, other looks at it. But yeah, now that I, now that you mentioned that, I, I really think, so I can understand why some people might not be able to get into it. If they, if they didn't uh, follow the comic, if they weren't fans of the, the comic or exactly. if they're not, you know, big fans of this kind of switching directions and switching kind of around. Yeah, the the movie in itself was an investigative, but that was through Rorschach's eyes mm-hmm. in certain cases. But uh, I think they're going to wind up doing that with this, where you're going to see it th- through different people's perspectives as they come in. And then we'll get a whole scene of an overall. I'm pretty sure we're going to get one through Adrian Veidt, too. where he, <laughs> Eventually, was, I would yeah. think. Yeah. And then they will mesh the whole story together and see how it plays out. I'm not sure how many episodes. Nine. It is scheduled nine. for nine episodes, yeah. So we'll see. And, and, and again, I don't think they haven't made an announcement on a season two. They haven't stated whether this is a self-contained show to where it's just going to be a miniseries of nine episodes or if they're, uh, you know, if they're going to continue it on after that. Yeah. So I guess they're, they're probably gauging some of the popularity and, you know, we'll see moving Before forward. Before actually stepping foot into that uh, season two <laughs> adventure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, but we'll get into more of the actual story itself as we get into our top fives. Absolutely. Sure, I, I think we have the same or very similar top fives. Is just going back to Lori Blake, and I can't. I, I have to admit, I make a, 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 a admission uh, here that it took me. I don't know why the first time I watched this, even with the scene in her house when they show the painting behind her head, and that's obviously a young Jean Smart in the, in the picture with uh, Night Owl to Doctor Manhattan and Ozymandias. It's obviously her. Even then, I don't think I figured out who she was until she's, she has that scene talking to Angela about the hidden closet in Judd's – or the hidden, the, the hidden uh, compartment in Judd's closet 
where yeah. she said, where Angela says, well, how did you know about it? And she says, when my father was killed, they found a hidden uh, room or a hidden partition in his closet. And then it was like, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. The first time I watched it, I went, Oh, Blake, the comedian. This is Lori Jupiter, Lori Janesque. Uh, Silk like, Spectre 2. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, this is Silk Spectre 2 who uh, was the, the you know, she was the daughter of Edward Blake, the comedian, and she was the lover of John Osterman, the second, I guess, the second woman he fell in love with. Uh, and, and then, uh, obviously, in the, in the uh, comic, we have her ending up with Dan Dryberg, which we'll get into more about Dan Dryberg Night Owl 2 later. But yeah, yeah it just, it, it, it amazed me that I didn't figure that out until uh, she said that. Uh, absolutely loved the the cold open where she talks about uh, capturing Mr. Shadow and that whole conversation <laughs> she has with uh, with the senator later is, is uh, or in that whole scene is hilarious. Uh, I, I love her in investigating and just what we're seeing at her. Uh, she... You know, she shoots without considering the consequences. We see that at the beginning when she shoots the guy in the back and you hear the officer kind of in the background go, how did you know that his uh, body armor would stop the bullets? And she just kind of walks away. And then with the whole thing at the funeral, when she shoots the guy and Angela kind of asked her, you know, what were you, what were you thinking? And she's like, well, you know, most of the time that's just a bluff. And <laughs> about the guy being, you know, the bomb being rigged to his heart. And yeah. uh, so it's just it's just this whole thing that this this character of, of Lori Blake is really really interesting. Uh, I was very surprised uh, for her showing up in Petey's room the way she did there at the end of the that that surprised me. So yeah, my number five, like you said, was the same pretty much. But I I was thinking to my head it was like oh Lori Janey, mm -hmm. and and then they used Blake, and I'm like oh she took. And it took me a few... I was like, oh, wait, the comedian. That was his last name. And she never had that in the the comic or in the movie. Right. So I, 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 I'd have, like, put two and two. But right away, I knew who she was because of the red hair. And uh, I'm like, ooh, she, she's older now. Mm -hmm. And she's got definitely got a sour taste in her mouth about heroes and with her job and how she is, you know especially the setup in the beginning. It's like, it was a whole setup. You yeah. I love that. I'm like, oh, she's going in playing. I was like, next thing you know, oh, no, nope, she's not bad. She's just part of the <laughs> FBI following up on these vigilante heroes. And I uh, love the woman, the woman who she takes hostage keeps struggling, like through the whole conversation, even when there's other, uh, you know, other characters around her in the bank are taking their badges out and showing and, um, and even Lori has kind of said, maybe the FBI would do this. She's still kind of, you can see her kind of struggling against Lori's arm until finally Lori, uh, like, lets, turns her loose. It's, it's almost like as an afterthought, Lori realizes, oh, I need to let go of this woman, you know? <laughs> and then she takes, <laughs> and she pulls her badge out, and you realize that everybody in the bank is yeah. a, you know, is a, is a federal agent. So, yeah, that was, that opening scene was, was pretty good. Yeah, I, I love that scene. Plus, the consistent phone calls to Dr. Manhattan and her just giving all these jokes about humanity. It's all, they're all based upon humanity and human and being human every time she calls him, but there is no response back. But I'm curious. I'm like, is it a satellite like phone call that they, uh, it looked like a dedicated company. I didn't know if it was set, specific to call him directly for people to send messages or or what yeah that's the impression i got was that this this madam true uh who who bought her out and pd talks about that about this madam true who bought out adrian bites company and that's what uh, on the phone booth it says like true or some or true or something like that and and so you get the idea that she has set up through their technology a way to at least make people think they're communicating with Dr. Manhattan. Uh, that's going to be the interesting thing that we're going to see going forward. If these, if these messages actually really do get to him, or is this just a, a fake out that uh, the, com the company is doing to take people's money? 
I'm assuming people have to pay for it because, you know, there at the end, the, the machine voice comes back and says, you know, thank you for being a platinum user of the blue phone booth, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. And, and so you get this idea. So I, you know, it, it's comes back and forth. I, I kind of went back and forth on it personally, just, is it true? Is it real? And I hope we do find out one way or the other. Like I, I would love for Dr. Manhattan to come back and somebody ask him about it and go, what phone calls? How, how would somebody <laughs> contact me on Mars? That's ridiculous. You people Which are is just odd too, because of the space junk at the end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, and then I had this in my notes was this whole question of, well, if it's not, if she's not actually talking to Dr. Manhattan, then how come? Cause that's Will's car. Obviously, the will the will's car, yeah. the one that was lifted up in the in the end of the last episode, that's the one that drops out of the sky right there in front of her. And uh, it's like, okay, if it's not if Doctor Manhattan's not involved in this, then who is it involved with this that is dropping this this car that lifted the car up and is dropping it? And where is Will if he's not in that car? So, yeah, very very uh, interesting stuff. Uh, that brings us to my number four. Yes. It's just that the whole talk that, that, uh, she and the Senator have about the defense of police act. And I, I like that, that we get the, we get through dialogue that this, this, uh, program is only happening right now. It's only happening in Tulsa. This idea of, uh, policemen putting on masks, hiding their identity and that, uh, other cities, though, are thinking about doing it. You know, he mentions New Orleans, Denver, and I can't remember the other. He mentioned like two or three big, fairly large cities who are also thinking about doing this uh, thing with with giving, making their police uh, secret uh, identities, basically. And I, it's a, it's definitely a, uh, you know, it's it's there's a. Uh, there's a little bit of a danger here because that's a very communist kind of thing. The secret police, uh, the, 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 you know, that the communists had and, uh, these kind of ideas of the police's identity being hit. I understand they want to keep them safe, but at the same time you walk a fine line between, well, no one knows my identity so I can do whatever I want with no consequences. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's interesting to see how this is going to uh, play out the rest of the season and how what this has to do with the conspiracy itself, uh, because just like the the uh, director there, uh, not the uh, director of the FBI, um, she points out, or, or the senator points out, the fact that the cavalry always uh, takes, um, uh, gosh, blame. They they claim they claim responsibility when they kill a police officer. And the cavalry did not has not claimed responsibility for killing Chief Judd. So that for the senator was kind of the thought that well maybe it's not the seventh cavalry, but then of course we're still seeing these guys coming out and wearing their masks and stuff. So uh, it, yeah, it's one of those things that that knowing Damon Lindelof and some of the way his show sets up, it's probably going to be um, down the road before we figure out the actual answer to all this. And I did find it really interesting that Agent Blake, she knows the identities of all of the masked cops, but she holds that protocol. She doesn't – like when she when she meets Red Scare and Pirate Jenny, obviously we know from when she talks to Looking Glass that she knows all their names, but she doesn't reveal them in front of that guy who they have blindfolded. So I thought that was really good that even though she doesn't like this whole masked – cops thing she's still going to hold on to the protocols and keep the the cops identity safe at least or keep the identity secret so that they stay safe i think that was based out of respect because she was once a masked person sure. herself and on top of that she is an agent and they had to disclose that information to the fbi so yeah obviously but i think it was more due to out of respect for those plus you know they already lost somebody to an attack right right so they don't need that mm -hmm. so my number four would be uh i find it funny that they refer to adrian Vite a lot in this episode they keep talking about him especially on the plane they allude that he had plastic surgery to hide 
who he is to others uh and uh you know and if he's still living in this world but i thought it was an interesting notion which we all know is the truth we know who he is and uh, somebody brought it up to me and asked me they go i it i it took them like a the the after the first episode to figure out that that was Ozymandias and he was like is that who Jeremy Irons is? I'm like, yeah, that's that's who it is. I knew that beforehand. As soon as I saw jo Jeremy Irons like cast and they show in the preview trailers of him standing there, I'm like, I knew right away who he was because he had that same look as the actor in the Watchmen movie. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to have that that keen look. Yeah, and, and like we, we've talked about the last two episodes, the, the IMDb credits has shown him as Adrian Veidt. It's not really until this episode that we get him actually saying his name and then putting on the Ozymandias costume yeah. there at the end that we get the confirmation that, uh, that that's who it is. And that kind of leads me into my number three, which is just the character of Petey. And uh, if you don't know, I, I really, really love this guy. I, I, I love how honest he is. I love how uh, he's just, just up, up front uh, with, with Lori, that he knows who she is. He's not going to pussyfoot around her. He's not going to pretend <laughs> that he doesn't know who she is just because she's famous or whatever. And uh, then he, he reminds her that he's got a PhD in history, uh, that he wrote his thesis on the 77 police strike when she and Dr. Manhattan were together, but were in Washington, D.C. before he disappeared. And just just all these things of this character, uh, I really, really love. And if you, if you haven't been following, the HBO website has a link you can go to called Petyspedia, and it has a bunch of articles that reveal a lot of things about this series and about the history, about what's going on, what's been happening, why um, certain technology, we, we're not seeing certain technology, and why certain technology is starting to come back into the, the police force and, and start into the, the common use. I, uh, I looked at a few of these articles. I'm, I'm going to admit I haven't dove deep into this, this website, but it is really cool. And if you're interested, go to the HBO Dot com website and uh, they have a link i think you can i think it's slash pdpedia something like that you can find it if you search for pdpedia it'll come up and it'll be hbo watchman uh it's got a bunch of articles on there they they update it after each episode and give uh, a little bit more information about it i'll talk a little bit more in my notes as well about the pdpedia but uh it's, it's really cool. I like this character. I like that we're seeing him. I thought when I first started seeing this website on HBO's website that we weren't going to ever meet this guy, but he is a character in the show. So I like that, that kind of confirmation that this is a good, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's part of the canon, I guess, is what would be the, the, the podcast canon way. of the comic and the, yeah, uh, of the show. Well, the canon of the show at least is, is for yeah. sure where, because, you know, the comic ends 1985 and, we're just going off what the show is has developed for the future. So, yeah, I have a few theories too <laughs> that I'll bring up later in my okay. notes that I didn't write down, but uh, you'll get a crack and laugh at that one. Uh, my number three would be uh, the scene when Lori sees what the holding system is like when wanting to talk to Looking Glass. Uh, the look on her face looks like a ragtag, you know, this is, her face drops going, this is just a ragtag team of cops trying to be heroes, but are not in her mind in some way. But she still gives them the respect of, yeah, they're masked and they're doing what they need to. Uh, they try to be heroes, but are being fooled about what is really going on in the world. That You know, they try to hold on to justice with the masks, but... Or they're just normal people, you know, trying to play with that same thought that they had years back with uh, the Minutemen and the Watchmen and all that stuff. She goes through the uh, the motions of the investigations of the FBI, it seems, but, you know, there's something lying underneath with that character I'm sure we'll get later on. 
Yeah, and that whole thing of when she walks into the pod with with Looking Glass, and and he, and she's like, she like grabs the remote, and he's like, Give me, like, can I have the remote? And she's just like, No, I'm gonna play with it for a little bit. And she, you know, flashes the the different flashes up on the side, and she's like, What does this do? And he kind of tells her, and she goes, Oh, it's a racist detector. And he's like, Well, that's an oversimplification of the. And then she's like, Really, are we gonna talk through the mask agent? Or a detective, um, oh, I can't remember if his Middleton or something like that uh, yeah. is his actual name. And he's like, okay, you can call me Wade. And then he pulls his his mask up so that she can see his face. She and he and then he mentions Sister Knight, and she goes, "You mean Angela Abar, right?" And he's like, "Yes, Angela Abar." So you you get this impression that she's 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 okay with yeah. When I'm outside and and we're with. The, the bad guys and all the other cops, sure, I'll use your silly little superhero names. But when it's just you and me, we're going to talk face-to-face. We're going to talk real names, real faces. I'm not going to gonna discuss this with a mask. I thought that was really – when she, you know, she's picking the seed out of her teeth uh, in his mask, and she's like, if you're going to wear a mirror for a mask, you got to imagine people are going to use it. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just hilarious that she's uh, just, just taking this whole thing and – on one hand, she's showing them how ludicrous it is, but at the same time, she's like, I am going to, you know, okay, the face that we're going to show out in front of everybody, I'll follow the protocols. I'm not going to give you away, but when we're one-on-one in private, I'm not, we're not playing this game. I think that comes from her comedic acting, and I think they needed that just to be that bit of jokey sarcasm with it, and I think that's what makes this for her character. Yeah, I really like it. yeah, yeah, very, very cool. Uh, so my number two is just that joke that she tells. You kind of already alluded to it a little bit that she she breaks down. Really, we get a lot about the characters in this this joke that she tells, and we get the idea that she she kind of breaks Night Owl down into his his basis component parts, which is that he was always trying to be the good guy. And he was always trying to be too nice. She breaks down Adrian uh, Ozymandias into he's Mr. Smarty Pants, who is actually a monster, you know. And then she gets to Dr. Manhattan and she's like, he himself is a god. And here's what differentiates him from you as a god or or from, from God, God. And then, you know, he's already living in hell. So when he gets sent to hell, it didn't matter. And then, of course, she paints herself kind of as the outsider, as she's the girl with the brick who's going to who's going to bring it all down. And uh, I really I love I absolutely love the callback at the end when she's like, good joke, snare drum roll. And she's even got the cadence, the the Rorschach kind of cadence from the movie uh, of of that line of drum roll you know, uh, and then curtains and all that really, really good delivery of those lines. Just that whole, that whole thing as they, and they used it throughout the episode really, really well. I I really, really enjoyed how they, how they did that. And then they wrap it up there at the end with, with his, his brains coming out as a very graphic kind of, uh, his brains come out his nose, uh, there at the end. So yeah, this, the, the whole joke that she, that she tells and just the, like I said, the way she delivers it and she's got you, Jean Smart is such a good comedic actress. Uh, even though this is not really a comedic role, this is not really a comedic show, but she's got that delivery, that dark humor. That's uh, that really, really sold it for me at least. I was definitely sold on. Yeah. It, definitely. <laughs> yeah. That, that character is, Oh man, <laughs> I just hope they don't dispatch some of these characters so easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like in other shows. <laughs> <watch>. <laughs> Uh, my number two would be the attack on the funeral. That that was really intense to watch. I saw that coming though. Uh, I'm like, oh, we're at a funeral. Oh, it's for him. Okay, they're gonna do the typical uh, police thing, and I'm like, okay, yep, there he is. <laughs> I was like, where? It's coming, it's coming. Uh, but I thought it was amazingly shot the way they did it. But always being the hero, she she had to act. You know. I love the fact that she, what, tosses the, the coffin in over the bomb and it explodes and it's all over the place. Yeah, it's it's really good. And, you know, I, I'm, I, I went, this is another one of those parts that I kind of went back and forth on as far as whether 
whether she is part of the conspiracy and trying to cover up uh, Judd's body by getting it destroyed by this bomb. Uh, I don't think so, though. Yeah. If if there's anything there that she was trying to hide, she might have been trying to hide the cocaine use that he had done. Because remember, in the last episode, Looking Glass asks her that was he was he drunk? Was he high? And she's yeah. like, he did a few lines of blow. And so we get this idea, and I think you mentioned this in the last episode, that cocaine is just like a regular thing. Like it's it's not even it's not even a big deal. The fact that there they are right in front of their kids, right there he is right in front of her kids, you know, doing cocaine. Yeah. Um, but so you know, there might have been something to that of her wanting to hide the drug use. But I don't. I really hope she's not involved in this conspiracy somehow. That, that you know, like this this could be like a backwards conspiracy to get Senator Keene into the presidency that they're going to, I don't, I don't know how it's, how it's going to work, but there's, there's definitely a, there's something more to this whole yeah. sequence of events than, than we're led to believe because. Yeah. There's a whole, you could see it from multiple sides and we could get into that. And you know, when I talk about my notes, but yeah, I, I, I know I see where you're going with it. Yeah. I feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The the chance though with the the collapse was really good, but was really great that how you know she took the cavalry guy down, mm -hmm. and I love the TikTok as, as it counted down to the actual event when he was get the guy was getting ready with the Rorschach mask mm -hmm. as he was walking out. That was a good intense. Yeah, it's really good, and then we you know we obviously we get Lori uses. I, I was kind of surprised that nobody mentioned the fact that Lori snuck that gun in and maybe that's going to come in, in the next episode. Maybe somebody's going to ask her about that because remember yeah. they took their guns when they, when they got to the, to the cemetery, they took the, the police take their guns and remember, cause Petey kind of has an issue. He's like, wait a minute, we're federal agents. And she's just like, give him your gun. Petey. Don't, you know, show some respect. And then she hands over her like main service weapon, but she's still got that one that's strapped to her ankle. You know, yeah, we saw her put on in looks like a twenty-five or something. Yeah, definitely a little gun, but st but still effective. So <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, that leads to um, uh, my number one. Yeah, we've already really kind of talked about it, but just that that uh, realization, that reveal of Adrian Veidt as the master of the manor, and just just kind of how he treats his servants. I don't know what's going on there with that um, whatever suit he was trying to. Uh, to get him in, is that a space suit or what that was? And then when the guy, you know, when the guy's body, uh, I guess, was it cold? Did it look like it fro the guy froze? Yeah, yeah so, that's what my first impression was. Yeah, so he froze, uh, whether it was being outside overnight or, or something, he froze. And so that's when he goes to shoot the buffalo and, and take the hide. I, he wants to get the hide of the buffalo, but of course the game warden stops him. And uh, just that idea of who is this game warden now we've, we've introduced that now there's another character in this, you know, when, when we get the letter from the game warden to the master of the manor, he says, when you came here for your incarceration or, or something like that, the, there was a, a certain arrangement that was made and you're overstepping your bounds. And so he, Adrian Veidt kind of says, well, if you think I'm overstepping your bound, my bounds, why don't you come here and say it to my face? Basically, so uh, yeah. so maybe in the next episode we're gonna get um, who the this. yeah more of this, or we're gonna get to see who the game warden is. I'm I'm intrigued. I want to know who this guy is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, obviously, a new character you mm -hmm. want to know, but you know that's gonna move on to the next episode. Absolutely, absolutely. So my my number one is way out there, and it's too obvious that it was pretty much towards the end. <laughs> what was with that blue thing? <laughs> um, uh, sorry, but that was out of nowhere, and I knew what it represented. <laughs> I guess Laurie still loves and cares and wants Doctor Manhattan back, or at least part of him. Um, yeah, you know, as we see his calling card at the end. Obviously, yeah. when yes, when she when she opens that that briefcase thing there is there is like a label on the inside of it that says something about dr manhattan or like it's almost like a, a comic book cover um but it says dr manhattan so i almost it almost looks to me like this is a 
why did you have to go here, Mark? Um, sorry, sorry. This we, don't, is... we don't have to say what it is. It's a phallic symbol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> we can leave it right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, it, it was wild. It was like, I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. And I got the message, and that was what we see. Okay. Yeah. But I just thought it was funny. I'm like, oh, wow. They're really going there. Yeah. <laughs> that was quite and an admission. We digress. Uh, let's go to our quotes. Okay. So uh, my first quote is uh, is just that when she's having that conversation with the senator at the beginning of the, the episode, and he calls the guy that she, uh, she got in the bank robbery. She said, he says the Revenger, and she goes, no, no, it's just Revenger. No, the, and that was last month. This was Mr. Shadow or something. She said, <laughs> this guy was Mr. called himself Mr. Shadow. So you get the idea that, that she, this is just routine for her, them taking down these, these heroes. Yeah. Uh, I had one, it's pretty long, but it, it's pretty much the whole scene, but the FBI director going, well, what the hell is this? And Petey's like, eh, it's an excerpt from Rorschach's journal, sir. The cavalry wears his mask, sir. I just thought for psychological context, sir. And then the FBI director's like, is this the 1980s, Petey? And Petey's like, um, no, it isn't, sir. Then who gives a crap about Rorschach? <laughs> so a lot is going on there. Rorschach was was the voice within the comic book about society and what he stood for. The cavalry is just using it for their own gain, from what we could tell, but are twisting it in their own thoughts. And I think that's what Petey was trying to do, was show them. And the truth was never really there as to what they were doing within, you know what we saw in the very beginning of the episode. That's what, you know, I think they were, you know, the, the heroes were always shunned because they were looked at as vigilantes, but they weren't really pointing a target at any particular race, creed, culture, or anything. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things that it kind of, it, it sh that little, the little bit in that scene shows us some things about the difference between the FBI in that universe and kind of, because you would think at least Okay, from the TV shows and things that we've seen in in our world, that they would th there would somebody would be all over this, wanting to know yeah. because obviously this is a big deal. The 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 effects of Rorschach from the 1980s, even though it's 30 years ago, are still being felt here. And and you need to want you want the psychological context. You want to know what's the motivation. You want to know what's going on. And the fact that this FBI director just kind of dismisses it is uh, is really telling. As far as, you know, maybe he's involved in the the conspiracy and he doesn't want the the cavalry to be, you know, suspected of this or something. It's, it is it is really interesting. It told us a lot about, uh, about PD, about his knowledge of history, about the FBI, and then just not kind of not wanting to even consider uh, the history of this. Uh, my, my other quote was when... When, she, when they come to the warehouse where all the the uh, guys from Nixonville are being held and she encounters the uh, Red Scare and, and Pirate Genie at the back of that van, she says to the guy who they've got her, she says, sir, I'm with the FBI. Are your civil rights being violated? And he starts to go off into this whole thing. Yeah. Yes, they came into my business. Like, okay, I'm sorry. I I was just kidding. I don't care. <laughs> you yeah, know, exactly. just you that. Know. Bad. She's just like, I really don't care what these I don't people really are care. doing. To. I yeah. just I just had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, I just had to make my presence known and move on. So I really I really like that. <laughs> a, and then we do see uh, Jenny and Red Scare bring that guy into the the warehouse after the agent comes in so it's, it's pretty yeah. that whole thing was was really good yeah and you do see genie carter's uh, uh dry delivery and everything just how it is and it is comical yeah. but yeah yeah i like that exactly uh Lori says do you know how to tell the difference between a mass cop and a vigilante and angel's like no and Lori's like neither do i yeah so it yeah right there it's just like they don't know because it, it's kind of you know, somebody could be dressing up as one of the cops as being like somebody could steal Panda's idea and just go around as Panda and start killing people or doing something. And uh, the police wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's that was an interesting comment from her. Just just that that idea of there's no difference between in her in her eyes. 
And and this is where I, I come back to the idea that even though she doesn't like it, she's going to accept it when she's in Tulsa. But it's like anywhere outside of Tulsa, she would be arresting these people. She would be she oh, would be yeah. putting them, shooting them. You know, anywhere else besides Tulsa, she would be the enemy of these mm-hmm. of these masked vigilantes. And and that's where her opinion is of it. So I think that's that's really really interesting, and especially in the case with Angela, because we we know that at least on the surface, Angela's not actually still a cop. Whereas Red Scare wears a badge. Uh, Pirate Jenny is apparently a cop because I didn't see a badge on her, but she's definitely running around with the cops. We know that Pan is a cop because he was working the the uh, you know the he was working the front desk at the precinct when the one cop called in in episode one. So we and we know that Looking Glass is like considered an investigator, an interrogator, or whatever. So you know, Angela really is the only one of these kind of four or five characters that we've seen so far that is is definitely someone that Lori Agent Blake would be arresting uh, in a in any other big city in America. Yeah, yeah. And it'd be interesting if they enforce that and she has to go further, which would actually subject us to another season, yeah. I think. Uh, so we already talked about one of my notes, which is the Dr. Manhattan phone booth. We've kind of already talked about that. Um, yep. So I'll let you get into yours. Let me give my, my last, because we've already talked about my two, the other one of mine. We're going to talk some more about the conspiracy as well. But the only other one I had uh, that I want to get into before we get into yours is that over on TV Podcast Industries podcast, they revealed that, again, in those PDPedia um, articles, they mentioned the fact that Night Owl 2 Dan Dryberg is in prison, is in federal prison. So I, I thought that was really interesting. I didn't I didn't know that, and so I kind of emailed those guys because I heard them talking about it on the podcast, and uh, they emailed back and said, oh, yes, it's in the PDPedia Articles, so I'll be this weekend. I'll probably be diving deep into those to kind of see. I want to see what all uh, if there's any more information about Night Owl Two about Dan Driver. If we can find out what's going on with him, because we know in the comic book that's the the comic book ends with him and Lori in bed together, you know, and that's one of the things that drives Doctor Manhattan to leave the Earth is because he sees yeah. that Lori has found another love. And so he, he leaves and that's, so it's, it's interesting that these articles give us any information about what, what got us from there uh, to here where we are now. Or maybe she arrested. Maybe that, that could be, maybe Dan refused after the whole 1985 stuff happened in the comic book. Maybe Dan continued to do his exploits. She went in and, and joined the, the FBI or, or whatever, and he continued to fight crime, and so she had to arrest him. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually remembered something in the actual episode where they allude to Dan being, he was in prison. Well, there's a, I remember hearing yeah, that. It's, no, it's, it, the senator makes a quick, the senator makes a comment at the beginning of the episode that if he becomes president, he could even get her, Al, out of its cage. And, yeah, that's and what so, I, yeah, that yeah, that's what I, I kind of picked up on that for some odd reason. I never, li- I didn't, haven't gotten a chance to, yeah, I, listen to uh, you're, TV you're better than I am then. Yeah. Cause that didn't, it wasn't until I heard them reference night out being in jail that I went, Oh, okay. Maybe that's why they think that. But I, I just thought he was making a comment about, I don't know. I, I, it didn't, I didn't put it together from that, from that little comment by the yeah. Senator. But like I said, they, they said it's in the PDP, uh, Articles, so I'm I'm with you on that. So it's it's, uh, but it is a nice it's a nice little addition to know that 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 character is still out there, and there's at least the potential in this series, or if it goes to a second season, there's a potential of seeing Dan Dryberg again. Yeah, that'd be nice. I wonder who. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I'm gonna disregard my first one, but I'll go into my. Yeah, because we kind of talked about the first one a little bit. Yeah, so uh, the the one that we could get into deep discussion would be this one, which would be Adrian Veidt and his attempts with creating his, what I think, his own Dr. Manhattan. That is what I think he's really doing on his land with, you know, the clone. Oh. 
or I'm thinking way too much into this, but I don't know how you would freeze somebody or what chemicals would freeze somebody's body to the point and you have to destroy it because you're pissed off. I think that's the real reason why he was in that suit. So, because we saw in the last episode, the Dr. Manhattan burnt up in that, in that fake little play that yeah. he had. <laughs> and obviously he goes, ah, oh, I have to get another clone. <laughs> and he goes, I'll step up. So I think he was trying to, it was like, oh, maybe I could give him something so he doesn't burn or something. Huh, that is an interesting thought, because it could, that that very well could be. I mean, that would kind of, it would kind of make sense if he's, you know, if he's in like an imprison, you know, if he's been imprisoned somehow in wherever he's at, whatever, whatever uh, place he's in, you know, um, yeah. that he's trying to escape. And one of the ways he could escape is because we know he did create a particle accelerator in the even in the comic book and they have it in the in the movie as well where he scatters dr manhattan's atoms and I mean, we talked about it when we did the movie review is that that whole scene yeah. in the comic books when that's when dr manhattan's atoms get scattered and then he brings himself back together and he tells adrian Vite that was the first thing i learned how to do was to reassemble myself so i i didn't even think about that 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 could be what he's trying to do he's trying to create his own Dr. Manhattan, or is trying to create the circumstances where he can become as powerful as Dr. Manhattan. Exactly. Mm. And Ozymandias is like, try, in my opinion, trying to take over the world again. You know, that that's where it leads to with my thoughts on that. But he's feeling his age and wants to leave a mark for the Earth. And I think that's where, like you were saying, that he could put that power into himself and he's just using these clones as, you know, test subjects. But also amusing himself in the process. Yeah. Uh, the skull and the crossbones is an interesting trademark, though. Apparently, he made a pact with someone, but what is it? Who is, you know, the game warden, maybe? Yeah, we finally got to see that scene where he rides past the flag. We've been seeing it in previews, and now we actually saw it in an episode. And then we saw it in the letter that he gets from the game warden is sealed with a skull and crossbones seal. So, obviously, there's some kind of uh, allusion, again, to the comic book, to the Curse of the Black Freighter uh, comic within the comic from the from yeah. uh, the, the comic book. So, yeah, I, I'm really – I hope we get some more of this next episode, but I, I really feel like knowing the way uh, Damon Lindelof and the way these showrunners work, they're just going to – it's going to dole out very, very slowly until we get to episode <laughs> eight or nine when they give us the full reveal of what's going on with Adrian Veidt and the game warden, the game warden. It looked like when I watched it this third time, it almost looked like the game warden had like a mask on over his eyes. Like there was a dark, it almost looked like the comedian mask on his eyes was uh, under that hat. Yeah. So uh, that was just, I, that was a quick glimpse. I got this third, the third time I watched it, I was kind of like, that almost looks like the little like mask the comedian would wear, but but it had the game board had that hat on, so you really couldn't tell exactly what was going on. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, interesting stuff. Well, my uh, my last and final thoughts, and this goes on the overall idea, and this could be conspiracy theory in my mind, but it's, uh, you know between well, Laurie being in the FBI. Maybe the FBI is creating or having these people do this to take down the police in Tulsa with the as being masked vigilantes, and that's their way, and it's their way of all right. Well, we're going to prove and that they're not doing their job, or they're not capable, or the idea of this mask thing is not working. And she's just there to investigate. She probably doesn't even know. And they're the ones that are underlying doing this, sending these people out to do these criminal acts with the Rorschach mask. Yeah, there's definitely this conspiracy. I, I, I think any theory at this point is valid from any of us, because yeah. we just yeah, don't the know. The only other one I could think of would be, uh, like, Maybe Adrian's doing this with his clones and having the clones go out. Yeah, it could be, could be. I, I really, I really think it's one of those things. Like I said, anything, any at this point, just about anything, because we still don't know what's going on with Will. We don't know what connection he had to Judd's murder. Did he just find the the body out there 
in the field? How did he get there in his wheelchair? How, what was going on with that? So yeah, we're, there's a lot more pieces to this puzzle that, that I think we're going to get throughout the next several weeks. And it, it's kind of, like I said, last episode, every time we get one answer, three more questions come up. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. what do we, how, how do we, how do we affect that? So exactly. Very cool. As a series as a whole. I'm really, really enjoying it. Like I said early on, uh, each episode for me, each episode gets better, better. I hesitate to say that this is my, this is definitely my favorite episode of the three that we've seen. Yeah, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that next week, uh, episode four isn't going to be the best <laughs> episode of the four that we've seen <laughs> yeah. because it really does get better and better each week. That first, in my opinion, that first episode was great. And the second episode, I really liked. It took a different, it took a shift. This episode, wow. Uh, Gene Smart, just it, amazing. And and so. Is it Gene Smart or Gene? Gene Clark? Smart is her name, is the actress. Okay. Yeah, Gene right. Smart. I got that yeah. wrong before. Uh, I wasn't sure. I wasn't going to correct you because I wasn't sure what you were referring to. So I left it out. That's what it okay. was. <laughs> Brian does it all the time. <laughs> but what about you? Are, are you having the same thing or what? Oh, yeah. like Just like you. It's like each episode keeps getting better. And like so far, this is my favorite. But, you know, next week's could knock that down in a heartbeat. It, it and honestly, it reminds me of the boys and mm -hmm. how when I first and I binged watched that in a whole mm -hmm. day, and that to me I couldn't get enough yeah. of it. And now we're getting a season two of that, but there's so much mixed reviews by people I know. And as I was leaving work today, one of my bosses says, "He goes, oh, oh." I said, "Well, podcast said he gives me that funny look, like, oh, okay, whatever." But I said to him. It, uh, he goes, yeah, I'm really liking it. I'm like really interested in the idea. He goes, I like both the comic and the movie. I said, well, the movie is slightly different from the comic. Mm -hmm. It had like, you know, we got into this whole conversation. And I said, but there's a lot of people that don't like the show now that I've talked to. He goes, seriously? I said, well, it's, it's a matter of taste and where you are. Some people, you know, they have other expectations. So, you know, they started watching this and, you know, I, couldn't get back into Castle Rock, but I should. But I, I'll i probably take a glance at it. I haven't watched any of the episodes yet, but maybe I'll like it. But I loved the first season, just like I liked uh, Haunting of Hill House. And I'm loving this. I love the boys. So hopefully, you know, people will turn around. And like you said, HBO might be waiting on a season two, you know, regarding this because of fan because look at what happened when game the season or series ending up and that, and that may be part of it is just that they're 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 kind of gonna wait and see until the episode until the whole thing finishes uh to decide mm -hmm. whether they want to go with the season two or not which i would be fine with this i will say there's something very rare that i'm i'm feeling with watchmen that i don't think i have felt with any other show this season or or recently is I'm kind of glad it's week to week. I'm, I'm kind of glad yeah. we get a week uh, to watch it several times to kind of digest it and then, and then talk about it and not – like I don't know what it would be like to binge watch this. And I, I say that because I almost think it's it's – I, I don't want to say it's too good to binge watch, but it's too it's too heavy to binge yeah. to binge watch. I think is a better way. Like even with with Castle Rock, those first three episodes are easy to watch one after the other. Um, episode four is 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 good as well, but they're they're easy to blend, and they they a, a couple of them pick up right after the the one before it uh these uh, now these yeah the first two the second episode kind of picked up right at where the first episode left off at but this episode is is definitely a departure from that uh so i i yeah i um I, this is not a show that i think even when they finish it and even when, when it's done i don't think i'll ever binge it beyond maybe two episodes at a time 
because yeah. I, I I just I couldn't see setting for nine hours uh, in in watching this in this straight. I, I you got to be able to digest it. So. Oh, definitely. It was like that a little bit with the boys because I think I went back and rewatched at at a certain point during the mm-hmm. day. I'm like, oh, let me watch that again because it's something I missed. Right. Um, a little bit of comic talk and news in general. Yeah. I finally got to read Joker, uh, Year of the Villain. That was done by John Carpenter, and it was really good. And I do recommend it to anybody that's out there and suggest you pick it up. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check it out for sure if I can. Yeah, the, it flew off the shelves, so yeah. you, know, uh, you could get it on Amazon. I got to go this past weekend. Some of you may have seen the pictures on our, our Panels to Pixels Facebook page. I got to go to the Tyler Comic Con and uh, spend a little time with one of our, our friends, Paik. And uh, got to meet Kevin Sorbo and Sam Jones and Caitlin Nacon. I'm a huge, huge Supernatural fan, so I got to get my picture taken, several pictures taken, with the Supernatural car. And it was actually a, a car that was actually used in production in Season 9 of Supernatural. The, uh, this group that, that does these recreations and does these, these picture moments for conventions and things, she had originally built it as the season one car. And so it had all the earmarks of a season one supernatural Impala. The showrunners called the company that, that does these photos, the, the group and said, Hey, we need to, we need a supernatural car. That is a replica car that is in the United States there. They were currently filming overseas and they needed to do some shots in Chicago. And so uh, they called them and said they wanted to use their car actually in the show. And so they uh, redesigned it a little bit where it fit the season nine version of the car and packed it up onto a a trailer and took it to Chicago and uh, got it in in the actual show. So uh, I was very, very excited to have my picture taken with an actual car that had actually been used in the show, Supernatural. So I was was excited about that. Uh, Like I said, Mark and I were talking earlier. I got to meet Kevin Sorbo and talk to him a little bit. Uh, I'm a I'm a believer in in Jesus Christ, and so is he. And so we got to have a little bit of that moment there with him. I got to talk a little bit with Sam Jones. I got to talk to Eddie McClintock, who was in the TV show Warehouse 13. Uh, he's a huge veterans uh, supporter of uh, military veterans, and so it was nice to talk to him. And he's not a veteran himself, but he's he's played them in his show and in the show Warehouse 13. His character is a veteran. And so it was really nice to, to talk to somebody about that and uh, just had a, had a good, generally a good time there. I will tell you that this was one of the few comic cons I have been to in the last few years that actually had comic book vendors. At it. <laughs> there was actually two or three uh, vendors that were actually selling vintage comic books. And I'm, uh, I'm not as much of a collector as I was back in the day. I, I kind of flipped through a little bit of the boxes they had, but I didn't buy any this weekend. Yeah, it's it's something that I do too. I I will grab maybe one or two, and if like there's an artist there that I like, I'll grab one of their books. Because last time I did that, I did that with Chris Claremont, and I wound up finding issue 100 of X Men that he had did. Got it for a decent price, and you know I was like, "Can you sign this?" Nice. Thing? So it works out that yeah. way, you know, for for those cons. You know, you might not have the ultimate value of the the comic but the idea is that you could actually have them signed it and you could actually you know they have these things where you could actually like records where you could put them in frames or something and then post them and hang them if you yeah. want and they could be artwork that hey this is signed very very cool so that's what i that's what i generally do i think i did that i still have to t- do that actually for swamp thing for um the uh, the artist who signed that for me nice then. And, and it and oddly enough it's like somebody said well it doesn't retain its value because it's canadian <laughs> and it was a canadian release from that year whatever and i was like oh and they're like oh but you have his autograph on there so it's valued something now i tell you what i'll say the same thing that my dad said to me 40 years ago when I, or 50 whenever it wasn't no not that long ago 30 years ago when i was collecting comics uh you know it's all about who you find and who who wants to buy it and how much they want to pay for it you know that's exactly. that's what it comes down to. Whatever anything that's collectible, that's what you're going to find. Is you you know you can you can go through Wizard or whatever that uh, uh, publication is that tells you how much a comic book is worth. 
sure, it'll tell you it's yeah. worth 20 bucks, but you can't find somebody who's willing to pay you. No, I'll pay for 20 bucks. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> so, so exactly. That, that's why I'm going through a lot of my comics holding on to the stuff, just downsizing it in the sense of the ones that I love, the ones that I got yeah. and that I have a memory of. And I'm going to hold the ones definitely that I have autographed from the artists or writers and just hold on to yeah, those. Yeah, very cool. So that that's my uh, feeling about that. On brighter news, we have uh, Disney Plus launching in five days. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Coming out the 12th. I'm excited. And then the Mandalorian and, and all the other yep. things that we're going to be able to get. Uh, so it's it's going to be exciting to, to when that drops. When that finally drops, for those that already – I know I, I talked to a couple people today who they didn't already have Hulu, so they've already pre-ordered it for the, the 12th. Or the yeah the twelfth and I said you know I'm I'm already a Hulu subscriber so I've got to wait un- until actually the twelfth to change to upgrade my plan to include Disney Plus so oh, yeah wow. according to the website that's what they're saying you've got to actually wait till the twelfth to actually change your plan your Hulu plan to include Disney Plus oh, so wow. which is not a big deal it's just <laughs> it just eh, it just kind of frustrates me that, that I got to do something separate I, why can't I do it now tell them I I'm fully intending to do it why can't I tell them so I actually signed up last night i put in for it i have my account it's just a matter of them allowing the app to be yeah available for the 12th yeah, i believe the 12th. so you would have to go to whatever you know if you use a roku i don't know if it's on smart tv it's on the fire tv who's already well who's already on the fire fire tv so i'm assuming disney plus they'll probably do an upgrade yeah. And, uh, you know, upgrade that to, at that point. Yeah. So if you have an Apple TV, you would have to download that app as well. So, and keep in mind, a lot of people, older smart TVs, this is a little bit techie information that I got today. Samsung's older TVs that you had from years ago that were smart, the beginning of the smart age of those TVs, the app will probably no longer work mm. come like December or just around 2020. Because they they really can't update those. The memory in the, the TVs can't work. It's a different operating system. So uh, they highly recommend that you get a media device like an Apple TV or Roku or Fire TV, Amazon Stick or what have you. So I recommend that to you. If you have an older TV, if it's not within the past three years... And it's far older, but it has smart capability and has the old logo of Netflix. I recommend just getting a particular device. Or if not, if you're ready to upgrade your TV, do so. But it's a, a lot cheaper just to get a device. Very cool. All right. I'm looking it up right now because I want to see if they have next week's title available yet. Yes. It should be on Wikipedia. Uh, so next week's episode of Watchmen will be episode four entitled, If You Don't Like My Story... Write your own. So uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read the description of it because it gives some spoilers away. But uh, there's the title for next week's episode. I'm excited for this. I hope we get some feedback for next week to share. And if you want to share your feedback with us on Watchmen episode four or any episode that you've already watched up till now, we can be heard on Spotify, Google Play. Apple iTunes or whatever podcast player of choice that you use. If your ratings are available, please give us a rating there. Give us a review. We'll read it for you. You can look at our website at panels to pixels podcast.com. There's a link on there or that, that brings you to our face. That'll redirect you to our Facebook page where we will have our weekly episode posts that you can leave feedback on. And that is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can also email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one, the TO spelled out right there in the middle, the number one at gmail.com. Or you can call us at 845 350 2095. Again, that's 845 350 2095. Leave us a voicemail there, and Mark and I will play it. Yeah. And if you want to do so, you could actually... We're on YouTube. I already uploaded the Watchmen 2009 movie review that Steve and I had done. So if you have YouTube on your Apple TV, Smart TV, what have you, just uh, do a search for Panels to Pixels podcast. You'll see that one come up. All it will have is basically our image of our podcast with the logo. And uh, you could hear the audio as you do. So if you have surround sound and you love 
you know, to have your surround sound playing it loud cause, or walking around as you're doing dishes or what have you, you could do that. You know, you could check it out on YouTube itself. We have, like I said, the 2009 movie review for Watchmen, and we have last week's episode as well of the podcast. So uh, if you want to leave comments, do so. Please subscribe on that if you can. And we will continue to upload as we go forth. And hopefully within time, we will have a direct YouTube URL that will require people to be listening and watching through nice. YouTube. So where else can people hear you, Mark? Well, I'm the co-host of The Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh on Talk Through Media. So we review The Walking Dead each week. Each episode per week, so we can't binge, obviously. But uh, I love it, the fact that, you know, with AMC Premiere, you get it a few days before, as you know, yep. Steve. This podcast will stay on the Next Level Podcast Network, as always. But there will be a link for Talk Through Media on occasion for you to go there and actually listen to some of our podcasts right off our website, which would be talkthroughmedia.com. Or if you want to just listen to us through the specific apps through your phone, your other devices, that would be, you can find us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn, what have you, however you listen to your podcasts. So right now we're currently working on a lot of things. So you get your podcast currently and uh, we want you to keep in touch there as well. So if you have uh, a love for The Walking Dead and like what the show is doing, please submit feedback there. And as always, we recommend any of the podcasts on the Next Level Podcast Network or other podcasts that are friends of ours. Oh, definitely. And as Steve mentioned, we're waiting for The Mandalorian to come and House Podcastica We'll have that there. So Jason and his friends will be podcasting on the new Mandalorian show that is going to be appearing next Tuesday <laughs> or this Tuesday, depending on Disney Plus. So I'm looking forward to sending him feedback on his first podcast. Absolutely. Well, that's our show for now. Thanks, for everybody, for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this was Panels to Pixels. Good night, everybody. Good night.